Hello, everyone. My name is Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a legendary record producer and sound engineer who's worked with some of the greatest music artists of all time, including the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, John Lennon, Bob Dylan, the band, Eric Clapton, Patti LaBelle, Melissa Etheridge, and Bonnie Raitt, whose Green Light album earned him a Grammy Award nomination. As vice president at Island Records, he oversaw the remastering of the entire Bob Marley catalog. He produced the soundtrack on Martin Scorsese's groundbreaking concert movie, The Last Waltz, widely considered to be the greatest concert film ever made, and earning him another Grammy Award nomination. He meticulously designed and built the world-famous Shangri-La Studios in Malibu, where so many great albums were recorded. In 1989, he was nominated for Producer of the Year at the New York Music Awards. In 2002, he won a Grammy Award for Best Country Album for his production of Keith Richards' performance of You Win Again on the Hank Williams tribute album, Timeless. And in 2005, he received yet another Grammy nomination for Best Blues Album for Hubert Sumlin's album entitled About Them Shoes. And the following year, he won the award for Best Blues Album at the Blues Music Awards. In his autobiography, Keith Richards said it all when he referred to our guest, quite simply, as a genius. I'm delighted to welcome the brilliant Rob Frabone to our show. Rob, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Harvey, thank you. It's really a pleasure. Rob, as a teenager, you got the chance to sit in on recording sessions with Phil Spector at Gold Star Studios, where you witnessed firsthand the use of the iconic wall of sound technique. What was the most important thing you learned from Phil Spector? Well, I mean, remember, I was pretty young. I was hitchhiking to Hollywood. I was 15. So I would sneak in there and then I eventually got invited in. And after a few months of that, I got to actually, and an engineer invited me into a Phil Spector session. So I witnessed a few of those. So what I learned, well, I mean, I, I, I was just sort of witnessing magic. I mean, of course I was young and very impressionable and, you know, I mean, I, I just was taking it all in, but I think that what the most important thing that I learned was about inspiration, about how he was able to draw the inspiration out of people, but he was, you know, a little dictator and, you know, there were things about him that were, you know, I mean, I was just in the, you know, the documentary that they put out on him. And I told a pretty incredible story on there about this track that got erased and how he, it had a choir on it and uh, he crawled under the console sobbing and stayed under there for four hours I mean, the, the, I, of course, took that as my cue to leave the room because I was just kind of a fly on the wall anyway, but I wasn't meant to be there. But the engineer later told me they stayed under there for four hours. Yeah. No, he was a very, you know, <laughs> intense guy. Who were your Im most important mentors? Well, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, a guy named Al Grundy that started the very first recording school in the world called the Institute of Audio Research in New York City. He was the most brilliant person I ever met relative to audio and taught me so many things. I mean, things that I never heard again from anyone. You know, there were, there were some engineers I met along the way that influenced me. I mean, I was a huge fan of Jimmy Miller, which I worked with him on, on this Goat's Head Soup record. You know, that was I only worked on that for two weeks, but still it was significant and it formed my friendship with Keith Richards that's lasted to this day. But Jimmy Miller was one of the guys I thought was the best producer. Of course, George Martin, there's you can't talk about record production without George Martin. You know, there's others as well, but those those two were I mean, well, Jimmy in, in particular was the the biggest, the biggest influence on me because he his approach was similar to mine, which and he happened to be a drummer, which I'm a drummer. And so he was coming from that point of view and uh, very interested in feel and not so much in perfection technically. And that's what I realized early in my career was that I was noticing that the records I was making had a timelessness to them. And after about five years, it kind of sunk in that I, I realized, you know, it's because feel is my criterion. 
And I learned this from Jimmy Miller, right? You know, he did those great Rolling Stones records. I don't know, five or six of them. And then, and Traffic, which is really, you know, significant, you know, as well. And his relationship with Chris Blackwell. So that's another person that had a big influence later in life with me was Chris Blackwell, who started Island Records and we're very close friends to this day. But he is, you know, to me, one of the greats. Ahmed Erdogan's another one. He was absolutely unbelievable, incredible. And he was also Chris's mentor, you know, which is kind of interesting, right? So I'm very intrigued by your comment that you make your decisions based on a feeling rather than on technical perfection. How would you define what good sound is in a musical recording? Well, that's a good, it's, that's a really interesting question, right? Because I think, I don't, I know sound is important. And of course, I'm, uh, you know, I came up from engineering in the first place and I was really all about sound. But what I learned was that sound is most important in terms of how it affects the emotion of what you're listening to. And that's when you listen to some, there's some great records that have this atmospheric quality in the sound that totally contributes to the whole thing and the feel of it. And I'd say that that's really the key thing as far as sound goes, because I don't know how, I, how do you define good sound? It's all so relative, you know, it's all so subjective. I mean, it's very difficult to say what that is. But when I say the difference between feel and technical perfection, it's like it's, it's the difference between wanting every note to be perfect in exactly the perfect spot or realizing Keith Richards said the first day that I worked with him, he, he said to me, he was doing this overdub. Everybody had left. It was the first night and he was overdubbing a bass on this song and he was in the control room and he turned around, he pl started playing for about 10 seconds and he stopped and he's, and he turned around and looked at me and said, listen, I just want to tell you something. I just play until I make the right mistakes. Right. And so that was really, you know, that's really what it's about. George Martin and I had a conversation about this because there's, you can hear plenty of flaws on the Beatles records. I mean, way more than you'd imagine. I mean, when you listen at home, that's one way of listening. When you're, li when you're working in the studio, it's more like being in the laboratory, if you will. And, you know, the microscopes are on higher power, so to speak. And, you know, you're, you're paying attention to detail in another way. And I, and when you, you know, the first time I listened to, I, when I was, I was working on a band record at Capitol Records and I said to the engineer, I was mixing a band album and I said, geez, you guys have the Beatles tapes in the tape library, don't you? And they said, he said, yeah. And I said, man, I would give anything to hear Rubber Soul and Revolver in the control room here, right? So he went and got the tapes. And oh, I mean, it was just the most, it was such a revelation. I mean, I, I, and, and that's when I started, that was just during that period when I was starting to understand this thing about feel, you know, how that was really where I was coming from. Because I, di I didn't do, it wasn't like a thought that I had that I did consciously, I just did it instinctively. Well, can you tell when you're in the studio whether a song is going to be a hit record? You can feel it. It's not that, you know, that's like trying to say there's some way to figure out how to win the lottery. I mean, it's something that you sense. There's a simplicity about it. Like when you hear something that's really going to stick, I mean, you that happened with You Are So Beautiful. With You know, that was the B-side of the third single from that Joe Cocker record. And the DJs flipped the record and started playing you, you Are So Beautiful and became his biggest single other than The Letter, which was a live recording of his career. And it was all about emotion. And that's actually how I got my first production job because I left that crack in his voice at the end, which the guy that started producing the record, Jim Price, you know, would, didn't want to use. And I threatened to quit. I said, you don't use that line. I, I quit. And then Joe took me aside and said, listen, you know, we're going to use it. Don't worry, you know, which we did. And it, it's the thing that everybody mentions, right? And funny enough to this day. So, you know, that's really, yeah, that, that's really what it's about to me. You designed and built Shangri-La Studios to the precise specifications of Bob Dylan and the band. What was it that they wanted that made your studio so unique? Rick Danko, the bass player from the band, he's the person that found Big Pink originally up in Woodstock, right? So, and then he and Richard Manuel from the band lived there. 
And so anyway, Rick found Big Pink. Now, coincidentally, after we did the tour in 1974 with Bob Dylan and the band, Rick found Shangri-La. He was living in Malibu, was driving down this road, saw up for rent sign or something. And so anyway, so this the meeting room in in that house was the stu- we made the studio and his master bedroom became the control room, which uh, that story is in the last waltz, actually, where Rick Dankel's telling the story to Martin Scorsese. So what happened was I never liked recording studios particularly because I felt they were unnatural environments. I liked recording in houses. And so so did the band. They had a very hard time with being in a studio. They, they, everything was not the way they liked it. I mean, they didn't like wearing headphones. They didn't like being separated from each other. They weren't used to it. And it, and it caused a big issue that they, it almost shut the whole first band album down. And they got past it. So anyway, so they always preferred that, which is what I, one of the things I loved about them. So Robbie Robertson said to me, Rob, you know, Rick found this incredible house. Why don't you go look at it and see if you could imagine putting a studio in there? And I said, sure. You know, so I did. And basically that was it. It was just strictly that Rick found this place. It had a great vibe. You know, it was in a great location across the street from the beach in Malibu and and a not, you know, nice big house with a lot of bedrooms and nice big kitchen and everything. We just, I just kind of took the principles that I had learned over the years, and I took a, a course from Al Grundy at the Institute of Audio Research about studio design. And I had built a couple of rooms at the Village Recorder, which is now still going big time. And that's, you know, I, I was the chief engineer from '72 to '74. There, that's where I did all those the big five records that I did in the beginning of my career were all at the village recorder. And that's where I met Bob Dylan and the band, for example, and the stones and Eric Clapton and Joe Cocker and, you know, all of that. So anyway, in the beach boys. So in any event, the specifications were really about, you know, trying to do it efficiently, trying to make a comfortable environment that everybody really, you know, could relate to and, and that sounded good and that was easy to use. And that had, you know, see these studio designers, they, they try to make these kind of perfect acoustic spaces, which don't really exist in real life, you know, and, and there's, and it kind of sucks all the character out of the sound, all this trapping that they do and all this stuff. So we, we left it, you know, so it had its own sound, you know, so it had, so you could hear the room. You cut five versions of Forever Young with Bob Dylan and two right. of them ended up on the Planet Waves album. I read that it was you who convinced Bob Dylan to put the slower version on the album. Is that right? Yes. I mean, it was funny. It was kind of like the You're So Beautiful story where I threatened to quit. First of all, what you got to know is that at one point, Bob said to me, and remember, I'd only known him for, I mean, we did that album in four days. I mean, and you know, I'd only known him two days or something. And he says to me, he says, you know, I've been carrying this sound song around in my head for five years and I've never written it down. He said, now, now I go to record it. I don't know what to do. So we had all these different versions, right? So anyway, so what happened is it was a powerful day. That was a Friday afternoon. I'll never forget it as long as I live. You know, it was about 5.30 in the afternoon and we recorded that slow version of Forever Young. We had already done all the other versions, right? This was the last of the five and all were completely different. One was just him with an acoustic guitar. One's the other one that's on the record, sort of a Cajun version. And there were a couple others that were, you know, had the band playing. And so this thing was so powerful. They did one take and uh, I was just plastered to the back of my chair with my mouth, like, you know, <laughs> while they were playing, I just couldn't believe what I was witnessing, you know, and everybody came in and listened to it. And it was so powerful that nobody said a word to each other and everybody listened to it. And you could feel it in the room, the power of this thing, you know, this song, you know, when we were listening back to it, it was just so powerful. And, and so anyway, so that was really a powerful experience. So now, a couple of days later, it's Saturday, and and so it's just Bob and I. And what we're doing is we're going through the, so, the the various takes of the various songs and making sure we were agreeing upon what the masters were and the various stuff. And so when it gets to the when when it get when we get to Forever Young, he says to me, "Oh, we're not going to use that version." And I said, "What?" 
And he said, no. And I said, wait a minute. I said, why? And he says, well, so his boyhood friend, Lou Kemp, who was in, he was in the wholesale fish business, who he grew up with in Minnesota, was there during the sessions and such. And I met Lou. And so he was dating this girl from North Beach Leather, a leather, the famous kind of leather jacket store on La Cienega and Sunset in uh, Hollywood. And he brought this girl by the studio. So we're, so, you know, we're playing some things back. And so she goes up. So Bob tells me what happens is she goes up to Bob and says, she says, geez, what are you getting mushy in your old age? And, 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 it, and it, you know, remember he's 35 or something. Right. And so, so anyway, so your old age and, and he, and he said, that's why you want to use it. And I said, Bob, I said, you must be kidding. I said, you, don't you remember that playback? And I said, don't you remember? I mean, what, you know? And I said, listen, I said, if you don't use that, I'm going to have to just resign right now. I said, I can't go forward with this. I feel too strongly about it. He said, you really feel that strong? I said, absolutely. And he said, okay, okay, we'll use it. You know, That's well, how it on behalf of the whole world, thank you, Rob Fraboni. <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> i'm glad too. believe me that's i love you know it was it was the closing song in the olympics year i don't remember what year but that was pretty amazing right yeah it's such a what a sentiment i mean golly huh you spent over 18 months working with martin scorsese and the band on the soundtrack for the last waltz what was the most memorable aspect of that project oh my god now this is a big question with a long answer i mean I went to the last waltz with Eric Clapton. So Eric was in LA and we took it. He got a private plane. We flew up to San Francisco. And so I wasn't there in official capacity. Of course I had every credential you could want, or, you know, I was tight with the band, but I wasn't part of the situation at that point. Well, the night of the show, Robbie Robertson said to me, Rob, listen, he said, you know, Obviously, you see what's going on here. I mean, you know, we're filming and everything. And he said, would you consider producing this soundtrack for this movie and, you know, and the record? And I said, of course I would, you know, yes, that night. And so then it was an 18 month deal. Some weird things happened, like the way, you know, Wally Hyder was the recording company the studio that had the recording truck that we used they hooked the power up they made a mistake where they hooked the power up and so they hooked up to the same grid as the lighting and so what would happen is when the lighting would go on full the voltage would drop and so the type of tape machine they had in this truck the ones that the or garth hudson's organ were on that five hour concert that night and replayed the entire thing. It took him three months to replay what he did that night. I'd wake up in the morning. I'd get the engineers going and have them working on the mixing the live record for the last waltz. And, and it was, uh, I had a big sign I'd put up, think live, think quick. Don't forget the audience. Right. And I made this big sign and I had that like they had to look at it when they opened their eyes, you know, when they were you know, at night where we were doing the, you know, the preparation for the mixing the film. And uh, that's a whole lot of work. I mean, all the editing and all the stuff that goes on. And that was the biggest bulk of the whole situation. But anyway, so, you know, we had four studios going a day for three months of the thing. But for 18 months, we had three studios going a day. Right. And I had to stop at every one and check on everything and oversee everything. The thing that was really remarkable was we were presented with these challenges that nowadays with Pro Tools and everything, you know, these things that we accomplished at that time are nothing. But at the time, there was no there was no other alternative. It's sort of like the Beatles records. You know, they had to be so creative and come up with all these ways of getting unusual sounds and stuff because they didn't have all these boxes and, you know, things that you can use that now exist. Right. Well, it was the same thing there that there was I, I basically developed some techniques that that have never uh, that were never used before and uh, there was a I'll give you an example of what I mean so I noticed that and I said this to Marty and Robbie you know I said you know 
music doesn't play very well on screen compared to a concert. I said, it's, it's a different experience. And I said, and you know, the, your, your kind of your attention span or your ability to stick with something isn't quite what it is when you're in a live concert situation. So I said, we've got to edit all this stuff down. I said, we got to cut a third out of all these songs. Buena Vista Social Club is a great example of how to edit a music film. There's not more than half a song in that film. Any right. song, there's only half, maybe a third. And then the rest of it, storyline and the rest of it. So it's enough to engage you and make you enamored with it and make you want to go out and buy the soundtrack, right? But you're not meant to sit through the whole, you know, a thing okay so and that really makes sense you know so i just said to them it was an instinct and i just said look we got to do these edits so they did these edits right and then they screened that did a rough cut screening for me at mgm and the edits were just horrid i mean you could hear every one i mean and i said to marty and robbie i said wait a second you guys i said what's this i said this is garbage we can't use this and so robbie said ah it's okay i said what do you mean it's okay it's not okay and Marty said, well, listen, you, you think you can do something about it? And I said, well, I definitely going to try. Right. And so I so at 20th Century Fox, they were editing the soundtrack part, you know, so we put up the first song. Anyway, I look and I see all the pieces are cut in the same place. So anyway, so I said to the sound editor, I said, well. I said, why are you cutting all those things in the same place? I said, you have the luxury of not having to do that. Well, that's the way it's done is what he said to me. And I said, what do you mean that's the way it's done? He said, well, that's just what I said. That's the way it's done. And I said, well, I don't want to do it like that. And he said, I said, I got an, a different idea. And he said, well, I won't do that. And I said, well, if you won't do that, I said, I'll do that. And so I literally cut that song. So in other words, I'd let the drums go to where they meant to be cut and I'd cut there. At the guitar lick, I let it carry over the drum edit you know, for a few seconds, wherever that lick ended, I cut that piece there. I cut all five pieces in different places. So it's impossible to spot an edit in the last waltz. Now, there's no way you could do that on a piece of two-inch tape. You could do that in Pro Tools all day long now, but at the time, nobody could do that. And so that's an example that there were all these, and I don't want to get to bore people to death with technical details, but there are a lot of things along those lines that I came up with for the very first time that nobody's ever done before. And to the extent where, you know, I got a call one night from Paul McCartney and he was working, he was about to, you know, working on wings over America. So I get this phone call in the days, you know, when you picked up the phone and you could hear, like you could tell when you had a transatlantic call, you could hear the noise in the back, you know, so I knew it was really a transatlantic call, not some English guys, you know, in the United States winding me up. So anyway, so this voice says to me, uh, hello, he says, is Rob Ferboni there? And I said, who's calling? And the voice says, Paul McCartney. And so I thought it was one of my English friends winding me up. So I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I said, you know, and so Chris Thomas was working with him on this, this other producer friend of mine. English guy. And so he's on the extension and he says, Rob, he says, it's Chris Thomas. He said, that is Paul. And I said, Oh my God, really? I said, Oh, I'm so sorry. Right. So anyway, then um, he kept me on the phone for 90 minutes asking me all these questions. How did you do this? How did you do that? Like all this incredible stuff. I, everybody said to me later, Jesus, you should have charged him a hundred grand for that. You know, but the big difference is See, this is a huge difference, and this is what I've devoted my life to, is the fact that digital audio is a very compromising situation when it comes to the emotional transmission of things. You know, the, the, and music is basically an emotional transmitter. I mean, of course, movies are as well, and especially the scoring of a movie is an emotional transmission thing, right? You know, not the songs that they put in the movie, but I just mean the scoring, you know, the, the orchestral stuff and all that. It's too, it's they're like emotional triggers. Well, this stuff has all been completely compromised. And so that's the huge difference. Like what the, we did with The Last Waltz was all 100 percent analog. And and the, and when the film came out, that was 100 percent analog. Now, the digital version that you can get now on it on a DVD is digital. And it's 
compromise. But I have this technology I invented called Real Feel that we're going to launch into the marketplace this year, finally, after 25 years of figuring this out. And it makes digital audio feel like analog. It became a big issue for me, especially because I emotion was where I lived in my work. I mean, it was about feel. And the very thing that was the most important thing to me is the first thing that got compromised by digital audio. And I was ready to quit. It's really pretty significant. I mean, the emotion has to be so powerful in a recording for it to get through on a digital format, you know, because you're going to lose a certain amount of it. And so it just becomes all that much the more demanding that you that it's so powerfully emotional. And that involves involves sound, like we were talking about earlier, how sound affects emotion. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned Real Feel. I was going to ask you about that. And I'm glad you explained that what you're doing is restoring the emotional content to the music, even though yeah. it's digital. So yeah, I'm glad it, you it mentioned really that. works. It really does work. When you were vice president of Island Records, you signed Etta James to that label. Yes. And you worked on her Seven Year Itch album and her How Strong Is a Woman album. Can you tell us a bit about your experience working with her? So this dates back to now. I don't know. We didn't talk about this, but Bonnie Raitt and I lived together for five years. And when we did the Greenlight record, that was after we had done a song for a movie called Coast to Coast that was uh, once in a lifetime was the song that we did and it came out amazing. And then she asked me to produce the next record. And anyway, so that it through, that was 1981. And so anyway, that's when I met Etta. I met Etta originally through Bonnie and then I got to know Etta pretty well. And then I would, and then she was friends with Keith Richards as well. And so, you know, this relationship was there, right? So now she went through a very difficult time. You know, she was at chess records. And so Etta was not, you know, she, I mean, at the time when I was at Island in 85, you know, she didn't have a record deal. And I thought, this is a sin. You know, I thought, you know, Jesus, I mean, this is one of the greatest talents of all time. And I remember to go in to see her at this club and, and she was able to like, I, I think it was at the bottom line. So it held like 500 people, right? And she could take the microphone and put it down at her side and sing without the microphone and her lungs were so powerful that you could hear her perfectly without the PA system. <laughs> I mean, I was like, I'd never seen anything like that in my life. So I went to Chris Blackwell and said, you know, Etta James doesn't have a record deal. And he said, oh, man, let's sign her. Right. So that's how that started. So now at the same time, I have been working with Melissa Etheridge previous to this. Right. And so Chris and I saw Melissa Etheridge in Los Angeles in Pasadena at a, at a lesbian club. We were the only two men in the place. And Dino O'Reilly, who he was, he ran Dark Horse Records for George Harrison when he had that situation with A&M. And Dino and Chris were friends. So Dino said to Chris, listen, there's this girl, Melissa Atheridge. You guys should go see her, you know. So we went and then and Chris said, wow. And I said, wow, too. And we were like, OK, you know, this is interesting. And and so anyway, so anyway, I ended up working with her. Right. So then. OK, we do the thing with Etta. Now, Etta finds out that I'm working with Melissa and freaks out. It's another woman. And it's like, you know, she just she just went off on me. And, and so basically, it, so it got handed off to Barry Beckett and he finished the record. I, we cut the tracks at, at Compass Point, you know, and I put the band together. It was Art Neville and a bunch of great players. And anyway, so then he he basically finished the record. I started it. He finished it. Right. And then there were some cuts. That second record you named was there were outtakes from the original sessions that made that record, you know, but basically that's the story. And, and, you know, she was, you know, she was one of the greatest of all time among the greatest. You've worked extensively with the Rolling Stones and especially with Keith Richards, and you were the sound consultant on one of their tours. What was it like touring with the Rolling Stones? Oh, it was unbelievable. But see, that sound consultant thing is very interesting. In January and February of 1974, they mounted the largest tour ever done at the time, using a private jet, which nobody had done before, and all of that. You know, it was David Geffen was on the plane, and, you know, it was Bill Graham and, the you know, the big players, right? So anyway, 
I got to be really close friends with the band. We just had a chemistry. And after that recording happened, I was with them constantly. And so it was the week between Christmas and New Year's and Robbie Robertson called me. He said, listen, he said, would you be interested in coming to the forum? We're going to do a test of Bill Graham's sound system for the tour. Would you, Bob wants you to come and, and just see what you think of everything. Right. And so I said, great, sure. You know, so I went there, the band is on the stage and Bob and Bill Graham are in the, you know, it's empty forum, you know, hardwood floor, whatever it is. And, and, you know, they're up on like a stage, the band's up there playing. And then there's a soundboard and this guy, Steve Gagne, that worked for Bill Graham is operating the soundboard. And so anyway, I walk in, the band's in the middle of playing. I'm standing there listening for about five minutes. Bob comes up to me and he says, what do you think? And I said, well, I mean, frankly, it doesn't sound too good to me. What do you think? And he said, yeah, I don't, I think, I think you're right. You know? And I said, well, he said, what do you think you can do about it? I said, well, I don't know. I said, but let's see, you know? So I went over to the soundboard and I, you know, talked to the guy and I, and I said, you know, let me play with this a bit. You know, the thing that's interesting about this is that you're, you know, hundreds of feet away from the sound. So every move that you make on a, on a console, it takes, because of the speed of sound, it takes time for it to happen. Whereas in the studio, you know, you're 15, 10 feet away from the speakers and it's instant, right? That was an, a bit of an adjustment for a second. Anyway, so I fooled around with it for about five minutes. I got it sounding quite a bit better. And so Bob came up to me and he said, Rob, he said, that's so much better. He said, would you be interested in coming on the road with us? And I, and I said, well, Bob, I said, I'm the chief engineer of the village. I said, you know, how am I going to do that? And he said, well, you go, he knew this. He had met Dick LaPalm, a studio manager. Bob said to me, you go tell Dick LaPalm when you leave here, you go see him and tell him that Bob Dylan invited you on this tour and see what he has to say. <laughs> so I went and told Dick and I said, Dick, listen, Bob Dylan has invited me to be on this tour with these guys. I said, I said, uh, I don't know what to do. And he said, I'll tell you what to do. He said, if you don't go, you're fired. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I'm going, you know? So that was the very first time anybody had this particular position that you're asking about, about the Rolling Stones ever, where I was an, uh, an intermediary between the band and the front of house mixer. So I would walk the hall and I'd come back to him and say, you know, the vocals aren't loud enough or, the bass isn't loud enough or whatever it is, you know, you know, you walk the whole room. And so, and it really worked out pretty nicely. Right. So, okay. So now fast forward to the Rolling Stones. Now, now Keith knew about all this because we got to be such incredibly close friends. So he says to me, he asked me if I would do that on a Rolling Stones tour. And I said, of course I would. Right. So anyway, that's what I did. I ended up doing it three tours and the first one was right after the, when I worked on Bridges to Babylon, the record in 1997, that was the first tour I did it on. And then I did it on the, a couple of following ones. And so anyway, but it was, it's a very difficult job. I mean, it's it, it, because you're, you're hated by the sound guy. It's very, it's very aggravating. You know what I mean? You can't please everybody. And then I'm realizing that the sound guy's not doing a very good job. They're, I'm recording the show with two microphones so they, they get a sense of what it's like from the way the audience hears it. And, and, it's, and I'm listening to those things in my hotel room uh, at night and I'm saying to myself, shit, I can't play this for the band. I mean, it's like, this, this, is, this isn't good enough, you know? This went on for like six weeks and they keep saying to me, come on, let's hear something. You know? And I'm saying to the sound guy, come on, you know, we got to fucking step it up here and get, you know, this got it's got to get better, right? Anyway, they finally heard it and it caused a big uproar and, you know, whatever it is. And so anyway, you know, I would I would never make it through the whole tour. I mean, I would just get so frustrated with the situation. I'd get it to where I thought it worked and then I'd have I'd have to just bail. And I and I plus I wanted to be making records and stuff. Right. But it was, it was a big help, though. I mean, at the end of the day, it did make a difference. And they and I really they had a horrible sound engineer and we won't even name the guy, but he was their sound engineer for a very long time. I used to tell Keith, I said, Jesus, you know, he's got to go. I'm not even going to say his name. And so anyway, I don't even know if he's still alive. But in any event, and, and finally, 
that got through. And, you know, the, interestingly enough, the guy that's their sound guy today, I, get, I got the guy's job. He used to work with Lenny Kravitz and brilliant guy, brilliant. And he, the best guy they've ever had. And, and he's been with them now for a while. You've produced almost every genre of music, rock, pop, country, R&B, reggae, blues. And you've worked with so many great singers and groups and with a huge range of talent, personalities, egos. Do you find it sometimes difficult to have to adapt to the particular style of each artist that you're working with? No, I mean, because, you know, like I said, you know, you take Phil Spector or even in a more contemporary, well, it's not as contemporary as he used to be, but Daniel Lenoir, let's say, you know, he's great and a friend and he's very good, but he too has a fingerprint. When Dan works on a record, you can tell that Dan did the record, right? So I'm not that way. I'm more like trying to get inside of the artists I'm working with and bringing them, drawing them out, right? So as far as the adapting to the times of music, it turns out that I'm very into all different kinds of music. I love classical music. It's funny, few people would realize how much Keith Richards is into classical music. You'd never imagine that, the Rolling Stones and classical music, but I mean really into classical music, really deeply. And reggae music, well, more people know that. The ability to adapt to the different styles was very simple, you know, because it's not, it's not that kind of thing. I mean, I'm more of a, a listener and a and a fan, if you will. Like, I mean, in a way, being a producer is about trying to be the common man. I mean, I always say to groups, you know, you, what you don't want to do here is make music for other musicians. I said, first of all, they get their records free or they don't buy them. And I said, and the thing is, you know, you're trying to get through the general public here, you know. And so basically, I'm trying to be that guy that's sort of a, a listener and that's an, an, an a sounding board for the artist, right? And so that that's really, in, in with respect to that, genres of music don't have any effect on that. I mean, it's all kind of the same. Well, when you go into the recording studio with a music star, what's the right attitude or approach that you want them to have in order to work well with you? Well, I'm not worried about them working well with me, but the, but I'm trying to get, you know, it's funny because Show Crow's manager, Scooter Weintraub, and I've talked about this. It's like you're really trying to get the artist to stand naked. You know what I mean? To be like open kimono, as the Japanese say. Like, in, in other words, you're trying to get them to just, you know, completely release all their preconceived notions about themselves and, and draw the talent out of them. I mean, that's really what you're trying to do. Right. So. It isn't about working with me so much. It's about trying to tune into them and figure out how to make them comfortable, how to create an atmosphere. Because really, if, as a record producer, you're sort of like a professional party thrower. You know what I mean? You're trying to throw this party, so to speak, create this environment that out of it comes this great performance. You know, that's really what the job is, right? So that's that would be the answer to that. Well, I would have thought... It would be helpful to you as the producer if the artist is open-minded. Well, of course. And that's not always the case, right? I mean, so I went through that with Jennifer Warnes in a big way, you know, where she went on a fast. This is kind of interesting relative to your question, you know. So she decides to go on a fast right before she's going to do vocals on this record that we did. We had a very successful record, had a number one and everything. So anyway, she goes on a fast. And so what happens is she's listless, you know, like, so she's trying to sing these vocals and, and, and get this, push this emotion out there strongly, but she's kind of listless because of what she's doing to her body with the fasting. Listen, I'm not against fasting by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a time for everything. Right. And so in any event, I have to end up confronting her and aggravating her to get her juices flowing enough to get good vocals out of her. There's an example of what you're asking. I mean, and, and that varies, of course, that's a very unique. I, I never had that happen in another situation ever, but that's an example. And, and I mean, every situation is unique. Every putty is different. Have you ever had a situation where the chemistry between you and the artist just wasn't good and you had to quit? 
You no, know, you know, it's very, it's very incredible. That's a good question. I was really, really lucky. The one record that I, I got found myself in the middle of that I found that I might have made. Well, I don't want to say it like that, but I mean, I, I felt like I might have made a mistake. But it was a pure Prairie League album. And, but it happened to be when I met Vince Gill for the first time. And he was 18 years old. And he had just joined Pure Prairie League. And I thought to myself, holy God, this is like one of the most talented people I've ever encountered. You know, it was like, what? You know, <clears throat> whereas the band was an issue. So I found them this really great song. But the feel of it was so important. And the drummer just couldn't get it. And the drummer was one of the principals of the band, right? So I had to bring another drummer in and boy, that was difficult. Right. And so that, you know, I'm just saying that that would be the, but I was so fortunate because all these producer friends of mine tell me these stories, these horror stories of things that happened. And I missed all that. I mean, and not only that, I never coming up as an engineer, there's a thing called agency dates that you do. That's doing commercials. Right. And it happens like from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the morning at the studio when nobody else is using it. And they're the most horrendous, high pressure situations you could ever possibly imagine. And I somehow missed all that. I did only one in my whole career. And, you know, I've been really fortunate. I mean, I'm very grateful, believe me. Which recording artist would you say you've learned the most from? Well, boy, that's a tough question. <clears throat> well, Keith Richards, for sure. He's way more astute than every, anybody could imagine. You know, it's funny. He says about himself, he says, well, you know, somebody's got to be Keith Richards and it turns out to be me. You know, mean the, meaning the drug addict and the pirate and the criminal and the whatever it is. But boy, he is just so incredibly gifted. I mean, in terms of his, his ability to hear things and all in the subtleties he notices and all that stuff. So that's really, he's, he's way near the top of the list, but I, I would have to say, you know, Wayne Shorter. Wayne Shorter is absolutely the most talented, unbelievably brilliant musician I've ever worked with, ever. That's saying a lot. Yeah, it is. I mean, I've been really lucky. You know, there's a lot of great people on this list. I can't even believe the list when I look at it myself. <laughs> but yeah, Wayne's way up there, man. When you're working with music artists who want everything to be perfect in the recording, is it ever difficult to know when the job is done and when to oh, say we're great, finished? Great question. Great question. I mean, that question applies so much to, to Pro Tools because the ability to perfect things into the, into the stratosphere is, is there. I mean, like it's knowing when to stop. That's really an interesting situation we have here so when you had you know 24 tracks and you fill them all up and then you know maybe you go to 48 or whatever it is but i mean there was a limitation with pro tools there's no limitation so there's no governor there's nothing you know what's going to stop that where where do you stop right that's a very interesting thing that happens with artists is that part of my job is trying to say to them listen we got this you know, they're wanting to, you know, because they're insecure. Artists are very insecure and I'm one of them. You know, I'm an artist too. And I get that. Right. And you're never really totally satisfied with what you do. You just finally have to just say, okay, I'm going to live with this. Okay. Well, getting an artist to feel that way is not the easiest thing, you know, but that's something that comes up for sure. Well, you know, as you've been talking, Rob, I can foresee two books in your future, a memoir, because you've had such an incredible career and a textbook, because you seem to know how to educate newcomers. What do you think? I mean, well, what do I think? I'm going to ask you. So are you psychic? Um, oh. I mean, th that's exactly what's going on. I mean, it's because, see, the thing is that I'm writing this book, but I'm not doing a, a producer's memoir because I talked to this book agent that pointed out to me that they, the, 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 the territory had been fouled. The playing field had been fouled. I mean, there were too many poorly written producer's memoirs and they were kind of almost like a, a curse to book publishers. And so, you know, 
so the one that sticks with me is 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 Hemingway's Movable Feast. I mean, that's really the most incredible memoir I've ever read in my life. I mean, and there's so, so much mystery in it. I mean, it's not, you know, that most of these books, you read them and you can just toss them in the fireplace when you're done reading them, but not, not Movable Feast. I've read it three or four times. I mean, you find yourself going back, you get to the third chapter and you're looking back to something you read in the first chapter. Now, there's a book where you get engaged, right? You get fully, incredibly emotionally engaged. So that's what I'm trying to do. And so I can't get too technical. I can't go over people's heads and so that's why the other book that you mentioned kind of a, a college textbook kind of book a producer's engineer's sort of handbook kind of book you know because I have the ability to do that I have tremendous amount of knowledge you know that yes. fortunately I still remember and so anyway uh yes it's but I said you're psychic because that's exactly what we're going to do <laughs> that's amazing I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Rob Fraboni by going to his official website, robfraboni.com. Well, Rob, I love the fact that you discovered early on in your life what you were really good at, and you developed a talent that has made a huge contribution to the music world. It's been a real honor having this opportunity to interview you. Well, you know, it's been an honor to be interviewed. I mean, uh, God bless you, and the, your questions are you know, it's you're right on the track, and I think we've we've revealed some good information here that hopefully will be helpful to people. I mean, I feel like what I do in my life, and I mean, you do this the same in a sense, is that we're here to help people. Like we're here to enlighten people, we're here to encourage people, we're here to make them see that we're all basically the same, and that you know, sure we land in different positions and stuff like that, but we're everybody, anybody can do what I do and what you do if they put their mind to it. It's just getting them to believe that they can put their mind to it and accomplish it is the whole deal here, right? Well, I agree with that. I I just want to thank you for the music, thank you for the passionate commitment to excellence, and of course, thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. All right. Bless you, Harvey. Thank you very, very much. Our guest has been legendary record producer known as the master of sound, Rob Fraboni. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my wonderful managers, Rick and Robin at the Marcelli Company in LA, and to my team at XPTV1 in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.